Fear stops us from achieving our true greatness. Are you a professional woman who is feeling stuck, unmotivated, or burned out? Are you worried about your wellness? Are you letting fear stop you from crushing your goals? If you answered yes to any or all of these, then this is the podcast for you. Dr. Charmaine Gregory, Night Shift Emergency Physician, Burnout Thriver, and Wellness Champion, along with everyday heroes just like you, will explore how to face fear in our lives and emerge victoriously. Hello, Fearless Freedom family. Welcome to another episode. Today, we have a special treat for you guys. We are going to be talking with the amazing super mama nurse and advocate, Bethany Brayman. Bethany, do you want to tell the audience all about you and what you're up to? Sure. Well, um, first, thank you so much for having me. I still think that this is this has been kind of a little bit of a process for me because when you first messaged me and were like, "Do you want to be on my podcast?" I'm like, "She has me confused with someone else." <laughs> like, <No. for> sure. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know why. And then I had to kind of go through this process of just realizing, like, the whole point of your podcast is about number one you confronting your personal fear of public speaking and developing that and confronting that. And then number two, it's just to highlight the diversity of women and what they're doing in the world and um, the different roles that they have and the different roles that they play and um, the different fears that they have to overcome with the, with that goes along with that. And you got it. And I say that I get that, but when you ask me, I still went through this whole like, I'm just so normal. Like, there's just like, what am I? But you're not, you're not so normal. (laughs) And then I just thought like, okay, well then maybe I'll talk about things that we have in common. And then I'm like, yeah, that's good. But that's not the point. Like your point is to say, I want people to come on here and tell their stories and just to be an encouragement for everyone. And I'm like, Oh, I say that to people all the time. I say, you know, you're doing a good job. What you're doing is important. If I can't think that my story is important enough to be on a podcast, then why am I being such a hypocrite telling other people that that probably feel like I do that I'm just so normal. Like there's nothing like, what am I going to talk about? (laughs) So that was a good thing for me to kind of like confront and think about. So like I said, I'm still honored and a little bit like, starstruck, I guess, like, what am I doing? But it's, it's going to be fun. And so I'm excited. I have, I have a perspective on talking about what I do as a mom and as a nurse. Those are two of the big roles that I play right now. And um, I just, I just had to, with this process, like kind of confront these things that I'm, these themes that I'm seeing a lot in women. I had heard um, a pastor talk about this a while ago, where he talked about these themes where we struggle with perfectionism and comparison. And like, I didn't want to be on a podcast if I couldn't do it perfectly. Like everything. Oh my goodness. (laughs) That's to make sense. And you know that, because that's like been part of the struggle for you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Or, you know, comparing myself, like hearing the other people that you had on, which none of them would ever want to say like I don't ever want to make anybody feel bad by telling my story I want to encourage them like encourage them and empower them to do that but still you kind of can shrink away and be like well I didn't start a business I didn't do this like what what do I have to say and I'm like that's totally missing the point like we should all just be cheering each other on and saying good I'm so proud of you for doing that here's what I'm doing and that's that's the point and so like I said this was a process for me to even get to that point (laughs) well I am so glad that you agreed (laughs) I was worried there for a second because I was like, why is Bethany like, you know, trying to duck me out here? Well, I never like, (laughs) and it's, I don't, it's funny because I think to myself, I mean, I know that I struggle with trying to have everything like be perfect and in control, even though people that know me are like, I don't think of you as a perfectionist. You're kind of like all over the place. But I think perfectionism means more not that you're all put together, but that you're trying to be. And so, you know, when, So I know that I kind of have those tendencies, but I didn't think that I struggled so much with the comparison aspect because I really don't take a lot of time to compare myself to other people. (laughs) But then all of a sudden when I'm like, oh, I'm going to be on this podcast, like what am I supposed to do? I'm like, that is just really, I was kind of disappointed in myself. Like, don't be like that. You tell other moms not to be like that. Why are you doing that to yourself? That 
that's not a good place to be mentally. And so, um, yeah, so this was a growing experience for me to even agree to do this. Oh, I am so glad to hear that. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of like really intense introspection. So, wow, I had no idea this asking would have done that. <laughs> so, well, I think plus two, because I had shared with you before, like I'm kind of in this space where I've had some opportunities to do a couple things here and there on social media, just with some photography stuff that I do. And, um, I'm kind of, I set one of my goals this year to kind of figure out what that's going to mean to me. And I, it's July and I'm still floundering through what that is, but I guess having an opportunity to be on a podcast is part of that. So. Amen. So, that's right, sister. You got it. <laughs> so I guess when it comes to like the two roles that I play the most right now, being a mom and being an ER nurse specifically, because that's a whole different ball game in and of itself. I say a lot of it comes back to um, my parents in the fact that, um, you know, they're baby boomers, their dads were World War II vets, um, you know, their moms kind of had this like role of um, after the war, being at home, raising these larger families. And like, I don't think my dad's dad graduated from college or from high school. I think he had an eighth grade education and my mom's dad might have graduated from high school, but never, um, never um went on to college or anything so my parents were both like the first wave of like college graduates and so college and all that kind of stuff was very important to them but my mom who has a degree in social work um, she worked until the week she was due with me and then chose to stay home with her kids and so the cool thing about that was my dad when we were growing up i never heard from him girls can't do math girls can't do science um, he celebrated that I was good at math, um, and he was my mom's biggest fan as far as her being creative, hardworking, motivated, um, all those things, but that her being home with the kids was still like her worthy choice, like that she chose to do that, and it still had worth, and that she could have been in the professional world, or she could have gone back to it at any time, and so I kind of had this cool balance to where I saw motherhood as both a really good thing, but I also saw like the other, like the academic side about it being such a big deal to go to college, and that my mom had a degree, like all those things being celebrated too, and so I kind of knew it was like a no brainer. You're going to have to go to school. Mom and dad are going to make sure of that, right. um, but like what? And so my sister, when I was 12, she was about 12. I think I was about 13 or 14 was diagnosed with insulin dependent diabetes. And that just became like a whole process for the family. So like I learned how to drop insulin and give her insulin injections. I learned about glucagon shots. I learned about counting carbohydrates and mixing like regular insulin and NPH clear and cloudy as a 14 year old. So I had wow. like exposure to medicine and we would go to the summer camp and um, when she was in junior high and it was my last year being like a junior high camper, um, we do an overnight in the woods. And my mom said, the only reason she, she can go is if you go and you be in the same little group with her so that you can help her manage her diabetes when you're staying out in the woods. And so, um, so that kind of was like where the medicine interest came in. And then also through this camp, I started working at it and I was like, how can I stay up here forever? As a <laughs> and you could stay as a high school volunteer if you had skills like so I could play the piano so I could play the piano for their little chapel services so that got me to stay five weeks one summer when I was like 14 or 15 and so the next summer I'm like how can I stay the whole summer you could stay the whole summer if you're a lifeguard so I took a lifeguarding class and my lifeguard instructor was in EMS and so he talked to me like you have to take the it was American Red Cross I'm assuming they're the ones that still do lifeguarding yeah. Yeah. And so I had to do my um, first aid and my CPR and I loved it. I, I mean, I, that sounds so weird. Like as a 15 year old to be like <laughs> CPR is so cool, you know, and, yeah. and the, the different aspects of it. So then by the time when it got to me coming to college, um, I kind of thought I would go to med school and um, I thought maybe like I'd end up on some mission field somewhere practicing medicine, like and I got to I got to my undergrad biology and I was doing fine. I mean, I got A's and B's. We're not talking about like star student that it came easy for me, but everybody kept talking about this like drive. I mean, you know more about this than I do, about like this drive to do med school. Right. And I'm like, I do not have this drive to do yeah, med school. If you don't have the drive, then you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think I want to do this. So I kind of floundered for a little while. And my parents, even though they kind of have always had that like, go do, 
you know, do what you love. They also have had a very healthy dose of pragmatism thrown in there. Like, sure. what are your skills? What are your gifts? You're not going to be um, like a, a, a famous ballerina. You know what I mean? Like, they were like, like I flunked ballet as like a little kid. Like, they, they, they just kind of had this healthy dose of like encouraging where they saw like aptitude and then kind of saying, now let's be honest, we can celebrate other people that have those gifts, but you don't. <laughs> and so oh, that's hilarious. My dad just kind of like, um, I kind of floundered after not deciding if I wanted to go to med school or not. And my dad kind of was like, all right. I mean, I know that I, I was very blessed to have my parents. They paid for me to go to college. And he said, all right, girl, I'm paying for this. Right. Um, how are you going to support yourself after school? You know, do you, cause at that time I was, I was majoring in music. So I went from being like pre-med to majoring in music. And, and he's like, do you want to teach music? And I said, Oh no, I don't have the patience for that. Oh, he said, well, <laughs> he said, well, what about nursing? He's like, it's science based. He's like, you really enjoyed the emergency stuff. You've talked about pediatric endocrinology because of what your sister and our family have been exposed to through that. And I thought, okay, I guess I'll go to nursing school. But if I do, it's going to be for something really cool. Like <laughs> nursing. So I ended up taking my EMT while I was in nursing school. And I got to participate kind of loosely because it was like a race to the fire department. We would live on campus and the fire department was off campus. And when they would drop tones for the call, you would try and race to the fire department to all get on the fire truck. So like seven of us would show up. <laughs> So I was on a volunteer fire department for about a year, like my last year or two of college, and I participated in the college EMS squad as an emergency um, EMT basic. And so I got kind of like the EMS exposure, and then I went on and did my preceptorship in, um, that we do in nursing school in, um, in the emergency department in a small little rural ER. And I just was hooked, and I was like, this is the kind of nursing that I want to do. Interestingly enough, though, my favorite... Um, clinical was labor and delivery. Oh, that is interesting. <laughs> and I kind of in my mind, I'm like, this like, is um, hopefully not doing too much of that. In <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So, but, um, I don't know, but emergency nursing and emergency medicine was kind of just in my blood. And so when I finished school, I went to school in Ohio. When I finished school, I came home. And even though the school I went to was decently well known for like its nursing department, down in Ohio, in Michigan, nobody really knew of it. And I had gone and worked at the camp one last summer after I graduated from college. And so I came home and I was like, well, I need to get a job. I had passed my boards already. And I wasn't getting like human resources to call me back. I don't know if a lot of like the nurse internships had already started, you know, and, and I kept hearing about this nursing shortage. I'm like, why am I having trouble? So I yeah. walked in, I walked into an ER with my resume and I'm like, where's your manager? <laughs> that's right. No, I mean, that's, that's huge. Take it into your own hands and literally go for it. Well, I was like, I don't, how do you do this? Like a lot of the places, cause I knew I wanted to do ER. I had done yeah. my preceptorship in ER and everybody kept saying, well, we don't take new grads or we have an opening here. And thankfully I had had, cause that's kind of like this mantra, you know how there's like different mantras and like um, medical education were like, well, you have to start here. You have to mm -hmm. do this. You have to do the grunt work. Well, in nursing, that's kind of one of them. They'll be like, you have to start with med surge. I'm like, well, why do you have to start with med surge? Who made that rule? And I get it because they want you to kind of like start and learn some like basic things and work your way up. But I did one nursing instructor that said to me, you know, like if this is something that you're passionate about, find a place that has a good orientation and just go with it. Yeah. And so I did, I just marched into this ER and I handed them, I handed, I said, where's your manager? And I handed her my resume and she's like, we actually are starting a cohort of new grads. And they took me up to human resources and they like handed me like a, like an informal contract, like, you know, based on drug testing and background. Yeah, and, that of kind course, of stuff. Yeah. and I remember going home and telling my dad, like, this is kind of crazy. I mean, I wanted, I wanted like a response, but I didn't expect them to like, right there at the spot. Oh, <laughs> you're you're right. Right. all right. Well, you're hired. So, and I thought, am I crazy for doing this? But, um, I took the job and I hired in as full-time midnights and you know what that's like just oh, the yeah. midnight people are they, we, they're just fun like they're yeah. just super close-knit <laughs> it's family and um 
and we were really young and really inexperienced and but we bound together and we were there for each other and I still look back at those like new grad years where I spent every day like praying that I didn't kill someone <laughs> like you just have that fear like yeah. it took about nine months for that to like that fear of that to go away but I just look at that time as like some of the most fun that I had at work just learning and growing and having people that had my back and um my preceptor he, he's a guy his name is Chaz and um I uh I don't know why he would be listening to this podcast but if you never any, know you anybody never know. knows Chaz <laughs> um, I'm a good nurse today because of him like he just really mentored me and he he had this perspective of where he was hard on the people that he precepted because he knew that one day he he was going to be on the same team as that person. And he wanted to make sure that we could all work well together. But he also was like super loud and like outgoing and everybody knew him. And here I am like petrified, like so inexperienced, no life experience. I was like 21 years old. I really had no idea what I was doing about anything. And I walk in and my name's written on the board, Bethany on the grease board. Yeah. Like, Oh my goodness, that's a mouthful too long to say. And he erases the A and A and Y and he goes, you're going to go by Beth here. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and uh, so that's how I laugh because now there's like this divide of like the people who knew me in childhood call me Bethany. And even though my parents would call me Bethany or Beth, like right. who know me post work, a lot of them just call me Beth and don't even know my full name. Oh, and wow. Chaz erasing the A and Y. Chaz like completely like. My first day of orientation. Redesigning your, your like, uh, your persona. Yeah. So, well, at oh, that point funny. I was like deer in the headlights. I literally had no persona other than help. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that sounds like, I mean, so it sounds like you were facing some fears there though. I mean, you were not sure. You knew your dad said, hey, you got to do something. You did the thing. You got the degree. You passed the boards. And then you, you're like, okay, now what? I can't get a job. So I'm sure you had some fear about, well, you know, you mentioned, how come, it, how come there's a shortage and I can't get a job? And you were brave enough to just walk into an emergency department and ask for the manager. So what made you do that? Like, what was the thing that you think that kind of helped you I guess I just figure, like, what do you have to lose? You know what I mean? Ah, like, okay. okay. So I go in there. These people don't know me from anyone. I didn't have any connections into that hospital. And I just got the impression that the human resources were just kind of, like, backed up and, and that maybe, like, things were getting lost. Because I'm like, I didn't, I wasn't a bad student. I passed my boards and it was kind of like, nobody cares when you graduate as a nurse, when you pass your NCLEX, nobody cares. They're like, you're licensed. Okay. You know, like, so I kind of was like, what? There really isn't like any reason why I shouldn't be, able, and I and I I knew I wasn't going in being like I want to work day shift. I have to have this. Right, right. I, I was gonna have to start from the. I didn't have any like uh, demands. I had no demands. Right. I was like, just give me a job. Give me some. Okay, some, okay. So, I kind of, so, so it's like that. It's like that open mindedness that you ex, that you chose to utilize, and then the um, and then that whole sensation of you know what, I'm afraid, but I have nothing to lose. Like, you know, these people don't know me. I can just go in here and, you know, the worst thing they could say to me is no, we don't have any positions. But then guess what? They said yes. <laughs> to get to yeah. your resources. And the rest is history. You got to meet Chaz. And, um, you know, that was a great base for you for a long career. So um, that's pretty awesome. That's an awesome story. And I tell, I tell that to, uh, I'm teaching clinicals right now and for nursing students, this is the first time I've done that. And it's been kind of a fun experience and they're just sponges. Like they just kind of like, can you give me any advice about anything? And that's what I tell them. I'm like, just don't be afraid to put yourself out there and maybe try a specialty that you want to do and just, just go for it. Know you're going to have to work hard. And I'm like, look for a place that's going to mentor you as a new grad. That's going to give you the foundation of the skills that you need and the people that are going to want to pour into you. And if you find that, even if it's not like the most ideal situation, I mean, the ER that I started in, 
it was nuts. We would, I would come in on a night shift and take report on, I don't know, 10 to 20 patients that were sitting in hallways and what? All, all this kind of that stuff. That is nuts. That's yeah. For one it was, nurse. It was as a new grad. I mean, there yeah. was, there was one night I remember where we had like, um, kind of similar to where we work, where you have people that are consistently in charge, but then you right. have like beef charge too. And so there was one night where the guy who had oriented me, Chaz, he was in charge at 11. So from 11 to seven, and he had been a nurse, he had been a medic for a while. And then he yeah. went on and did his nurse. So he had a lot of experience, but he'd only been a nurse for like two or three years. And then every other nurse that was on that night was someone mm -hmm. who had he had oriented. So oh, like wow. <laughs> collectively he had like maybe three years of technically being an RN yeah. and then everyone else that was there staffing that night was someone he had trained. And I remember wow. looking around, we were solid. We knew our stuff, like, you know, time wise, we hadn't put a lot of time in, but we had all worked really hard to know what we know and then know what we didn't know so that we could ask. And that's one of the best ways to be safe in, in medicine is, you Absolutely. know, know know when you need to ask for help. So, so then from there, I actually met my husband in that ER. He was a basic EMT transporting patients. And I was like, nope, I'm here at work. I'm doing my thing. And the rest is history. And so I ended up migrating out. That was down river. And I ended up migrating okay. out, um, Ann Arbor way and ending up at St. Joe's. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I've kind of been with that health system now for, I don't know, a while since 2004. Yeah. So, well. so, um, yeah. And that was where I, you know, I wanted to get more of like the trauma experience. And so with that, I took my CPR instructor. I, through the ENA, I, um, the, the ENA is the emergency nursing association. I became an instructor for two of their core classes that a lot of the emergency nurses have to take the trauma nursing core course and the emergency nursing pediatric course. Okay. So I would teach those. And then I also got to participate in something I never thought I would do research. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I remember taking my nursing research class and thinking, this is horrible. Like who would want to do this? <laughs> no, like I just don't. Uh oh, this girl. <laughs> and, uh, but I had this funny opportunity and this is like, we're, if you're just willing to kind of like be friendly with people and be hardworking and show that you're interested in things, people will like, Hey, you know, Beth may be interested in this. And so there was a, a nurse, she was a clinical nurse specialist on the unit. And she kind of was like, Hey, they're doing this research thing and it's with the fire departments and CPR and this hotline and these devices. Mm -hmm. And I think that you'd be totally a good fit for this. Why don't you go check it out? And so I did. And so I got to work with a trial where the devices ended up getting FDA approval and it's, a, yes. um, and I, and it was a blast because at the same time, like my husband and I were starting our family. Um, he decided to go to graduate school. You know, we sold our house, moved in with his parents so that we could try and do graduate school and stay debt free and all this kind that's of stuff. Right, that's right. And I'm, you know, two o'clock in the morning up with a teething baby answering like a hotline, like, you know, oh my gosh. the trial, you know, trial. Wow. Um, okay. What, what, what time was your dispatch? What was your arrival time? Was there yeah. CPR? But it was the coolest experience ever because we got to do it. It mixed all the things that I love, like the emergency aspect, the education aspect, the interacting with the fire departments and the EMS. And, and I knew a lot of these people that would call in because I, I staffed still, I was contingent and I was Staffing. And so that was a really wow. experience to be. A I mean, that, that sounds like something that was literally like right up your alley. Like it had your name on it. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was so much fun. And um, so, yeah, I don't know that I, I could do research in general, but that one, that one was for me. It was like perfectly <laughs> geared for me. So. Awesome. So you, you talked about how fear plays a role. A number of ways. So we talked about what the early career fears. Do you, are you having or experiencing any fears right now? Like um, you're going to transition to mid to mid career? Um, yeah, a little bit just in as things have changed a little bit, um, some of the education structure from where I, I work has changed. And so I'm kind of at this place where I, n I need to kind of figure out that's something that I love to do. I love to teach, but I have five children. And I love my kids and I That's up to you by the way. <laughs> and um, I have I have chosen to like at this stage of my life, I'm home with my kids. 
for the most part, I work one day a week and I carefully try and guard that. Actually last week I worked three days, which was very abnormal. Oh, wow. That's a lot. And the emotional meltdown of everyone when that was Oh yeah. Over, They're like, what? Where's mama? Where'd mama go? I only work one day a week because this is like the house just kind of depends on my stability and our house is pretty chaotic anyways. So like, we're just barely stable. Like hanging on. Just hanging on my thread. <laughs> um, but it was just a combination of a couple things. Like I said, I took the opportunity to teach clinicals this summer and it worked perfectly because I knew I couldn't do my first time teaching clinicals in the fall because I homeschool. And right. so the combination of doing something completely brand new and wanting to do a good job for those students and plus balancing it with my kids, I'm like, if I can find clinicals that I could try in the summer to even see if it would be a good fit for me, that would be perfect. But I already had had staffing days planned and different okay. so like there was a little bit of overlap. Um, but yeah, so I think I do have a little bit of a fear of just wanting to tr still find that balance of being able to encourage and um, help nurses as they transition, <clears throat> especially newer nurses and graduate nurses, but knowing that with me only working one day a week, I'm not really going to be in a precepting or educating type of mm -hmm. formal role. So, okay. um, but I don't think that I'm necessarily afraid. I think it's more just the just realizing that you have to just, just how I kind of history has taught me. You just have to keep putting yourself out there and being able, willing to like jump as the opportunities come and realize that that may be some sacrifice in some ways of just, you know, fitting the schedule together. Like I said, even taking on the clinicals this summer, we had to kind of rearrange a lot of things in the mm -hmm. summer to make it happen, but I'm kind of glad I did. So it was, it's been a good experience. So yeah, I, I, it's good. You know, it's like a uh, chance favors a prepared mind. So that's a perfect example of that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's cool. And then so, um, yeah, so you kind of mentioned something in passing. Were there any fears associated with homeschooling? Um, yeah, but I don't think that the fears associated with homeschooling, I don't think that they're really any different from fears that are associated with parenting in general, because I think as parents in general, your biggest fear is just like that you're going to do everything wrong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and I was a very, I was just the best parent ever before I had kids. Oh and, yeah. And then oh, the yeah. first kid I had, I was actually a pretty good parent because when you only have one, even though no offense to moms with only one parent or one kid. It is very, very hard. That's a very hard stage. I think honestly going from zero to one. That's a difficult one. Yeah. One of the most difficult stages mm -hmm. because you're just life is totally upended and you're just handling what you can handle. And that's just, you know, cause people will say you have five, how do you do it with five? And I'm like, well, I was just as much of a basket case with this one <laughs> as I was with five because it's just, you're, you're kind of traumatized by your first child. You just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, by the time my first baby was nine months old, I'm like, she's sleeping, she's eating. Oh, it's all good. Ready for I another. <laughs> And then, um, you know, at 18 months, I had my second one and that was just like game over. That's where you find oh, yeah. oh, yeah. grips as a parent where you're like, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. And as long as I'm honest with myself and other people about that, we're going to be okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. Now that's the truth, you know. There's no Instagram perfect up in here. <laughs> no. And, uh, yeah, for real. And so I think like when it comes to fears about homeschooling, so I was homeschooled. And so from that perspective, I think it's almost more comfortable for me to homeschool because ah, I, see, I'm yeah. familiar with it. And I don't have a lot of like the mental baggage that some people associate it with it. You know, like my kids don't just wear jumpers and culottes. And, right. <laughs> you know, like uh, they do know how to talk to people and they oh, like to be active. So it's, it's, there's like... So I, there's a lot of like the fears that I don't have because I'm like, really, I was a product of that. And I kind of even wore it as a, not, not anything against homeschooling, but it kind of wore it as a badge of honor when people would say, oh, you were homeschooled? I'm like, yes. And I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> like, wait, am I like, uh, I'm I don't have like, you know, I, so, um, and my dad always used to say when we, when he, when we were all homeschooling as a family, he would say, everyone homeschools. It's just to what degree. Did you potty? That's true. The homework is homeschooling, right? Teach them to brush their teeth. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's just when people think of education, they think of that they delegate out the formal education. But before you got to that point, you were homeschooling your child. You were reading books to them. You were mm-hmm. um, teaching them to ride their bike. And so um, mad props to teachers. I think of them from about Thanksgiving to Christmas and from about Easter to summer break, because that's when I'm pulling my hair out. And I'm like, <laughs> and they have 30 kids in their class. Like, I did it 30. <laughs> and I love these guys. I love yeah, exactly. I so, guys. um it's nothing about that. It's much as just, you know, my husband is in healthcare and he does shift work and um, it works for our family. I love the one-on-one attention the kids get. I like them being able to go at their own pace, whether it's fast in one subject and slower in another subject. I love that we learn together and kind of have our own family culture. And so, yeah, I think for me, the fears of homeschooling are more the feel, the fears that parents have about anything. Like, am I going to fail at this? What am I doing wrong for my child? What am I not exposing them to? What am I exposing them too much to? You know, just, um, and I think that that's where we just have to look and say, there's no one way for society to work. There's not everyone can own a lawn lawn company. Like if everyone owned a lawn company, who's doing healthcare, who's doing technology, like that's right. That's right. And as moms, we have different roles and we have 24 hours in our day and it's going to look different and we're going to delegate different things. You know, we, we know that like we're more morally obligated to take care of our children, but what does that look like? Do you delegate that they go to daycare or childcare or school for a little bit of the day so that you can do the other skills that you have as well? And it doesn't make you a bad mom. And I think that as moms, we just need to be more supportive of that, that it all looks differently and, and you just need to balance that that for yourself and your family and just, and realize that it's going to be, it's going to shift and change. And then you're going to get to stages two where you're like, Whoa, this is out of balance. We have to fix this. Something has to give, something has to change and that's okay. And, and having your kids even see that having your kids see your roles change and, and you say, well, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to have to sacrifice this in order to do it. And I think that that gives them a healthy perspective on life and how everything um, interacts with it. And from, and kind of works together and plays off each other and with that to find that balance. No, that was very well said. That's so, that's so true. That's a, that's a huge pearl. I think that uh, hopefully um, you guys are in the fearless video tribe, you're listening and you're picking up on that. That's huge. It's just like, you have to really understand that everybody's truth is different and you know, it doesn't mean that what you're doing is wrong and you cannot compare yourself. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's the biggest thing because you even mentioned before at the very beginning, you talked about how that comparison mindset can really kind of cripple you, you know, and you just can't, you just got to like be unapologetically you and just yeah. roll with it. Yeah. And um, so funny about that. So next week, I, I don't know, depending on where this will air, I'm talking yeah. about me wanting to do things on social media. I started to do oh. a little bit of things with photography. Very and, nice. Um which is funny because I don't consider myself artistic at all. And so the very first photography class I took, it was this um, girl named Ashley Ann and she had a blog and I actually followed her blog because I appreciated what she had to say about motherhood. And I thought, Oh, she takes such beautiful children of her kid, pictures of her kids. And they're like not posed and they're all just like enjoying their play and enjoying life. And I'm like, I want to learn how to do that. And she taught us a class online. And I thought, you know, she has such a beautiful heart even if I can't learn a single thing from this class because I'm like sciencey and technical and I don't consider myself artistic, she can have my money. (laughs) Oh (laughs) gosh. (laughs) Because I just was like, she's just, she has a nice spoke to you. (laughs) And I'm going to try and learn from her class. But if I don't, I won't feel bad. Like I won't feel like it was a waste of money. And so that's how I first learned to like use my little Canon Rebel and start taking pictures of my kids. And then at the end of her class, she had, um, like for further study, and she had this teacher named Nancy, who's become like a huge mentor to me. And she has this really active Facebook group and the, the people in there are just super encouraging and super positive. And the times when I'm just like me, social media, I just want to chuck it. I'm like, oh, but there's Nancy's group. And it's so <laughs> wonderful. I've taken all of her classes. I've taken some of hers twice. And then through that, I found another photographer who teaches at a place called Illuminate. Her name's Heather Robinson. And she does this thing okay. called the hashtag the week of mama where we encourage, um, where we take pictures of ourselves with our kids and, um, and then we 
post about it for a week. And the last time I did it, I was like floored. I'm like, people look at this and they read these and, and people were, you know, commenting about it. And, and so when she said, Hey, let's do another one of these. I thought, okay, I'm going to, because I do think it's just good for moms to like see me next to my kids in my workout clothes with my ponytail. And it's not because I'm lazy and I'm giving up on life and, you know, yoga pants and messy bun. It's because I've set aside part of myself to give to my kids. And the self-care that I did for myself that day was that I got my workout done. And so if it means if I stay in my workout clothes the rest of the day, it, it's, it's okay. And it's okay for other moms too. And it's okay to just realize that, you know, we don't need filters and our kids just, to, our kids are going to want to look back and see us in a real form them and see how they remember it. And they see mm -hmm. us as beautiful. They don't see us with the, the critical eyes that we see ourselves. And so, um, I think it's good for our kids to see us doing that and for our kids to see us having goals and, and doing things like the other thing I'm doing right now is I'm training for a marathon. <laughs> oh, that's right. That is right. How's that going? Uh, I just, I just ran right before we recorded and okay. um, it's going okay. I did one nine years ago. It was about nine years ago. I ran the Detroit nine years ago. Or I jogged and then kind of like limped across the finish line. Hey, you finished. I walked, that's, I walked, all, that's all that matters. I think I walked the last five or six and then, um, but it was crazy. My husband was in graduate school and I think I kind of, I kind of had this problem where like when we're doing something, like I need to have like even more goals and even more goals because like I get caught up in the adrenaline of like something big is happening and I just kind of need to keep pushing. Like that's how I survive. Yeah. And so I think because he was doing school, <clears throat> I kind of was like, I need to be working for something too. Granted, yeah. I was <laughs> working flex and we had two little babies and he was working full time and going to graduate school. So I was like, I'm going to run a marathon. I'm yeah, because, like, you know, there's plenty of time for that. <laughs> I was five <laughs> months postpartum. Like when I think about that now, I'm like, that was not a healthy choice to do, like just knowing. Um, and so that's why I kind of want to do it again now. Like, yes, I'm older, but I'm also training healthier and smarter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I, I knew that I wanted to do it before I turned 40, my husband was like, what's magical about 40? He's like, no. <laughs> He's like, why is 40 so magical? He's like, if you want to run a marathon, go run a marathon. And I right. do Detroit. And then I have some good friends that um, they have um, started uh, with the organization Love Runs, okay. where they work for work. Um, specifically locally within the metro detroit area to have all the runners that run with them um camping to earn $1,440 per runner you don't have to but that's like their goal in mm -hmm. in that being that that's how many minutes there are in our day and that's how many minutes of freedom that we have and and how much human trafficking and sex trafficking are still a big deal in the united states and i I was kind of ashamed of myself from the perspective of when I was in nursing school, I had the opportunity to spend some time in Thailand. And then before I switched jobs from the first ER that I started in to the second ER that I worked in, um, I spent a month in Romania as well. And I had some exposure to like these concepts, but I naively had the perspective of, oh, this is so sad, but it's happening in these other countries and I'm here for a month. What can I do about it? In gotcha. Thailand, we were in a rural village and we were taken care of. I mean, the very first patients I ever started IVs on, they were like little kids with HIV and they had wow. HIV because the rates of prostitution were so high in the city. So when the, the, the workers in the country would go to the city um, to sell their wares or, you know, sell their food and their produce to bring the money back. They would, the prostitution, all that kind of stuff was so rampant there that they would bring these diseases back to their homes and their families. And so I was, I was giving medications that like, like amphotericin B Oof. that I, I, the last time I remember giving that here in the States was when we had the fungal meningitis outbreak. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I, terrible. Had not, <laughs> I had not heard of that drug since, mm -hmm. since Thailand, you know? Yeah. So, so I kind of was exposed to like this concept of the trafficking and human trafficking and prostitution and those types of things there. And then when I was in Romania, I remember the child beggars and our interpreter who was about our age, she was like, watch your pockets. She's like, they're trained pickpockets. She's like, but don't give them money. She's like, we can have them eat with us. And I'm like, why would we not give these kids money? Mm. 
like they're all pimped out. You know, they have, they're working for their pimps and they're taking this money back to them. And so, um, and I just, I just was like, and then I had another friend that was there from nursing school who was working with orphans and she was talking about how foreign adoptions were closed. And she was saying how the, the reason the foreign adoptions are closed is because they can't control the trafficking of the children through the, the adoptions. Like that's a fear of these these countries. And I thought, I have so many friends mm. that who can't have children who would mm -hmm. love to do this and it's cost prohibitive. I'm like, this can't be a real thing. Mm. And then, you know, time distance kind of separated me from that. And then when I thought I, I was going to run this marathon and I knew that my friend was doing this um, with love runs, I thought, is this really like a thing here? Like, is oh this yeah, it's huge. Deal? I had no, I just was shocked. And so, um, and just, you know, hearing about like how big it is at events like the Super Bowl, and then oh, thinking yeah. about when the Super Bowl was here in Detroit and how that was going, or they talk about the auto show, how they, um, they go to the different hotels in the area around the auto show and they'll leave like hotline numbers on bars of soap in the hotels and all that kind of stuff. And, yeah. um, I guess to me, it still seems small. Like I can't imagine, I look at the life that I've had and that I've had a stable family and parents that loved me. I've had a job. I've never been hungry. I've never needed anything. And I just feel kind of helpless. Like, what do you do? But I think when I go out on my training runs, I want my kids to have this perspective of like, you can't save the world, but you can do one thing. And if this is one thing for me right now to <clears throat> run this race and earn some money. And also from the perspective that I won't ask anyone to give to something I won't give to. So for my campaign, I'm, um, I'm going to match everybody's donation up to the halfway point and then put in the other half until we get to the, the 1,440, because I just want people to know I'm not going to be campaigning for something that I'm not willing to sacrifice for as well. And, uh, so that's just kind of where I'm at. So I did four miles today, four miles yesterday. We've got an eight mile long run on Saturday and in this heat and I don't do heat at oh, all. OMG. Like I know you, you love the warm weather. I'm like, is it fall yet? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm ready for like sweatshirts and hoodies. And oh man, I am so <laughs> anti cold weather. <laughs> <laughs> so when I live in Michigan, what am I going to do? I know. <laughs> That's awesome. So we'll definitely make sure that we, um, do you want people to support you for the, for the, um, the mom photographs as well? You want, yeah, you know? I can put the, I can put the links for the, the different instructors that I mentioned, if you want to add those and, um, you can follow on Instagram. I'm at, um, Bramany at Bramany. So like my last name, B-R-A-M-A-N with a Y at the end. So kind of like Bethany and Brayman at the same time. Okay. Um, and so if you follow me on Instagram, it's, it's, it's a public account. So anybody. Can okay. So I'll make sure that's in the show notes. And then I'll also make sure that we put the fundraiser for the running fundraiser in the show notes as well. Cause you we want people to support you and cheer you along. Cause are you posting on, I saw that you had a couple posts on Instagram talking about. Yes. I've had a couple it. posts. They really encourage oh. people. I, I laugh. So I like, think you <laughs> might have to put some more out there now that this, know, is gonna, right? this is going to be. I'm going to push for this to come out this weekend. So this oh, awesome. means that you can like, you know, try to get some more people on there. So uh, hopefully you'll get, get up to numbers. And they've got some of the people on the team that are fabulous about using their social media and doing like live videos. And I'm like, okay, I can do this yeah, one of the, on one of the runs. Like this, it doesn't take like a long time. Literally you're on the run. Hey guys, I'm doing my, you know, eight mile today. And you know, have you? Except it's this more like this. Better. Hey guys, I know. Does it matter? <laughs> if you're out of breath, that's better. <laughs> you can see the copious. Because everyone can feel that. <laughs> like, okay, I took a few steps to run my first mile, and I'm dying. Oh, so I know exactly. Week, what got, we did six miles last week, and I got back from my run, and I'm like, I told I. I, my kids, my little two-year-old, she comes up, you're sweaty, mommy. You're sweaty. I didn't have a single inch on my clothes that wasn't saturated. I mean, I was Aww. just choked. So in this heat, it's, it's, for me, it's rough heat. It's rough and I'm staying hydrated. There you go. That's perfect. That's perfect. All right. Oh my gosh. What a great conversation. Um, you know, it's always so good to just like sit down and talk. I kind of feel like we're at a coffee shop, right? Okay. Cause we, you know, no, no one can see, you guys can't see this, but like we're 
we're doing this through Zoom, so we're having a video chat, and Bethany's petting her dog in the background. You might have heard, <laughs> like, the, the doggy footsteps and, and everything. Um, so it's just really cool to, to do this. So um, great conversation. You got a lot of pearls. We now have some things to support that you're up to, your photography, and um, your upcoming marathon that you're going to do before the magical age of 40. Right, Bethany? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'll be 39 this year. So, oh, I'm see, there you go. You like sure. it a whole year early. That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. All right. And then, so now we have to do like the traditional things that we do on the show, which we ask those three fill in the blank questions. And the first one is um, fearless freedom. To me, fearless freedom means not falling into the traps of perfectionism and comparison. Awesome. And then if I am fearless, I will. Uh, Love God, love other people, love learning and be loved. Love it. That is great. And then the last thing is your, what's my, your battle cry. So my battle cry is. So my battle cry is do the next thing. You just take it one step at a time. Just one, you know, just, just do the next thing, the next opportunity that comes your way when you're overwhelmed, just, um, just take the next step that you need to take and just be patient with yourself through it, you know, and, and you don't know what opportunities and what adventures and what things that you'll experience in life just by being open to take the opportunities that come in front of you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cause I know this is like, um, the audience doesn't really know this, but this is our second go around on this recording, which is all good because it was perfectly amazing. This go around. And so, um, so we're, we're looking forward to your feedback on this episode. I hope that you will drop comments and that you will just give Bethany some love on Instagram and with her fundraiser. And um, we'll catch you next time. Thank you for joining us today on this journey. Fear is all around us. It strives to stop us from achieving our greatness. We have the tools to be overcomers by sharing our stories, supporting each other, and doing self-reflection, we can do this. If you found value in this conversation today, please be sure to subscribe to and share this podcast with your friends. By going to your favorite podcast platform, leaving a review and a five-star rating, you will help to get the word out about it. And that is much appreciated. Thanks again for spending time with us. I appreciate your time and your attention. It is my hope that you will punch fear in the face today and that you will be strong, be brave, and unleash your greatness.